It's now time for questions to the Minister for Education, and I call John Stewart. Please. Thank the member for his question. The Minor Works Capital Programme remains under pressure. However, the Department has successfully bid for an additional £15 million of capital for Minor Works in the January 2021 monitoring round. Investing all of this additional capital before the end of March 2021 will be challenging. However, this additional capital is an extremely welcome boost in relieving the ongoing pressures. I call John Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his response. And I'll declare from the outset uh, an interest as a Board of Governor on a number of schools. Setting aside the um, frustrations and concerns around COVID um, and, and the lack of information sometimes that principals receive, the single biggest issue that I get complaints and issues raised from principals and teachers is that of the delays around minor schemes and capital works. Um, almost every school in my constituency has raised concerns, having been on waiting lists for years. And one school minister has recently had 20 repairs to its roof in the last two years, even though it's been on a waiting list for a new roof for 10 question. years. That sounds penny wise and pound foolish. How do we get to a situation where these repairs can be ca carried out in a timely manner? Yes, I think the issues across the uh, sector in terms of the level of investment that is needed is well in excess of what's uh, directly available. So the last call that was made, um, there were around about 6,000 applications uh, in terms of minor works that. Uh, were received in October 2017. Uh, those have then had to be ranked as part of that, and obviously as well in terms of where we are in October 2017, there can be an intervening period, uh, various works that can be put in place. There's over 1,300 of those schemes have been completed or are currently being progressed. And so from that point of view, um, there's also additionally around about uh, 625 emergency and unavoidable schemes were progressed in the last financial year. I anticipate that a similar number would be done in this financial year. But as with anything, the, uh, the level of capital budget is always a mix between what we have in minor works, what is there in school enhancement programme, what is there in new school build, and it's about trying to get a mix between them. Uh, as with anything, although I think COVID has acted as a level of uh, constraint on what can be done from a practical point of view, uh, it is always the case, notwithstanding that, that if there was a capital budget that was twice the size of what it is, then I'm sure twice the money could be spent ultimately in that regard. So it's operating within that. I can entirely understand the frustrations of individual schools who will see issues around that, and sometimes the answers to that will be in minor works. Sometimes, as perhaps the member alluded to, there can be a danger that, that simply doing a minor works in a school can be throwing a certain amount of good money after bad which is why we have capital programmes in terms of both major works and, and SEPs, but it won't cover every situation. But if the member has any particular direct concerns in terms of individual schools within East Antrim, I would be happy to receive correspondence from the, the member, and we can then chase down the detail in relation to those individual cases. I call Pat Cackney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, uh, can you provide an update on how the additional £18.1 million announced in January will be spent and whether any of this uh, funding will be carried over into the next financial year? Aim on that in terms of capital funding, that was through um, the monitoring round. £15 million of that is directed towards minor works. Uh, a lot of those will be used, which can be actually um, brought forward. Obviously, one of the issues that has been raised particularly as regards uh, some of the minor work schemes uh, will be the were risk assessments have been done in terms of fire risk assessments. Now, quite a few of those were planned then for 21-22. The additional money that has been able to be received will meant that, that we can front load those, which means that um, there is around about 35 minor work schemes uh, which are mainly focused in on those recommendations, uh, which are therefore able to be brought forward. And these works will be initiated immediately and as much work completed in the financial year uh, as possible. Obviously, it is challenging when I, we will always try and bid as much as possible as we can um, in monitoring rounds, where is a, I suppose the one restriction, if you are getting a January monitoring round, anything has to be really be spent directly on that front by the end of March or alternatively surrendered. But the aim is to, while this is through the Education Authority, to press the EA to try to make sure that as much as possible is done between now and the 31st of March. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister, and congratulations on getting that extra money, money for the minor capital investment. Could I ask 
in that investment, I know you've said that there may be a problem getting it spent by the end of March, but we do have an issue that we need increased accommodation um, space in classrooms to allow safe social distancing to happen. Can any of that minor capital investment now be used for those schools to ensure that we can get our children safely back to school? Well, don't forget, we, we do need, if you're talking about um, safe social distancing and indeed works of that nature, it would probably go at a level that in terms of from the point of view of reaching that from February to being implemented in March would be very difficult in that, in that regard. So we've got to be trying to be creative as, as possible. I think anything that can be spent, anything that can be diverted in that direction uh, will be. I think the practicalities of uh, even just issues around procurement and some of those issues will mean from a practical point of view, given that it's a monitoring round money, to have that, um, much of that diverted, to be honest, between now and the 31st of March is going to be, it's going to be difficult. But we're trying to uh, the delivery mechanism on the minor works is through the Education Authority. We're trying to ensure that as much pressure is kept on the EA to make sure that there is a higher level of spend as possible. Moving on, I call Pat Simclone. Kesht Everett O. Question number two. Thank the member for his question. Just give me a moment. At the beginning of the pandemic, I set up a continuity of learning programme with a focus on supporting uh, pupil learning. Recognising the specific needs of the um, Irish medium sector, I included a separate work stream for Irish medium education. This brought together representatives from across a range of educational bodies and support service organisations. Specific resources have been provided for Irish medium schools and pupils through this work stream. Guidance and support for parents has either been translated or developed. Workstream representatives have facilitated links with the BBC with a view to increasing its bite-size Irish medium programming. The Education Authority has developed a website to provide a single point of access for information, especially during a time of remote or blended learning. This website includes a distinct area for Irish medium schools to access resources, guidance and support through one portal. My department works closely with its arm's length bodies on providing resources, uh, support and solutions for our practitioners on the ground. And that includes providing uh, specific funding to the Education Authority and CCEA to provide Irish medium support. Furthermore, Altram, who are funded by my department to provide support to the Irish medium preschool sector, has developed a range of resources, including uh, phonetic resources for parents' uh, own language development and audiovisual language resources to assist parents with remote learning. All this work was informed by the valuable advocacy of Sina G as the representative body for the Irish medium education sector. This partnership approach, uh, working, uh, sorry, this partnership approach will continue and be built upon for the benefit of all pupils in the Irish medium sector. I call Pat Simcoe for something. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer. Uh, could the Minister just clarify if, in fact, that support that he has outlined is in reality or is in fact an additional resource and additional support, financial and otherwise, that is being provided to the schools? Resources. And so, for instance, there have been resources that have been produced by CCEA um, as part of the, the programme. Uh, so, for example, I'll give you an indication of the range of interactive resources that are available. There is an early years phonetic scheme that has been developed to extend to years three and four. A dictionary of, of mathematics terminology, Irish language uh, talking clock, electronic versions of translated textbooks and development of a series of, of talking books for post-primary to provide auditory exposure to the language. I, I suspect part of the complication that, that has been faced from a practical point of view is probably the extent uh, to which on-the-shelf sort of resources are available from outside of Northern Ireland. And so, I suppose where there's been a level of disadvantage that the Irish medium sector has had is that uh, with English medium education, largely speaking, can draw down, for instance, from resources in the United States and Canada and in various other places. To a certain extent, then, I think that a lot of the work that's had to be developed and has been developed, for instance, by CCA, has started much more from a, a base position of what can be done internally within Northern Ireland and looking, I, I suppose, to the Republic of Ireland if there is any additional assistance can be provided there. But that has had a level of constraint which has meant that, that on-the-shelf resources have been less readily available. I suppose additionally from the practical point of view, and we try to give a, a greater level of flexibility to Irish medium schools, I think one of the other disadvantages that they have had has been that the number of, of substitute teachers that they could draw down, because it requires a level of specialism, um, 
And there have been other sectors which have faced a not dissimilar uh, problems. I don't want to draw direct comparisons, but the pool of people that can be drawn upon, for instance, to provide during the, the periods um, of uh, the COVID response uh, to provide all those, those full support bits has maybe been a, a, a narrower pool in that regard, and that has obviously created some level of constraints as well. I call Orlia Flynn. Uh, call you and I thank the Minister. That was a, a very detailed answer. Um, but we know that there was, particularly at the, during the, the first wave, there has been significant gaps in relation to Irish medium, um, the Irish medium sector, but also organisations representing newcomer families. And I know, Minister, you had mentioned in your first answer there around the work streams that, that were set up. Um, but can you outline uh, you know, what um, direct engagement you have had throughout this process with the Irish medium sector and indeed any of the organisations working with the newcomer families? Well, I think thank we you. tried to work with all the various sectors, with all the, the different groups. Uh, to that extent, I think that in terms of resources the EA provided, they've tried as much as possible to provide translations. And we recognise that particularly there's, there's a wide range of, of newcomer families uh, within Northern Ireland from a, a very diverse parts of the world, uh, which does make it, it, it challenging to meet all those, all those needs. I think uh, the member highlighted particular problems um, in the, the spring of last year, and I think, uh, to be fair, that was something in different ways that actually hit across different sectors, uh, because I think none of us, I think, would hold our hands up across this chamber and anticipated the level of disruption that was going to happen last spring. I think it's undoubtedly been the case that through a range of sectors, um, certainly the feedback I would generally get, particularly from parents, uh, has been that the level of remote learning, the level of assistance that is there during this lockdown, while I think all of us accept that face-to-face -face teaching is the, best, um, uh, is the best possible opportunity, has been much better uh, in this period of lockdown than it was in the first when essentially to a large extent people were caught um, unawares. I would also indicate as part of the support has also been then uh, in terms of information to parents and translation because I suppose again one of the, one of the particular issues and barriers uh, within particularly Irish medium education and indeed education for newcomer uh, families as well has been that, that while there's been a lot of work has been provided by way of remote learning, by way of lessons directly from the schools, the, the, the intermediaries in this are quite often the parents on the front line of this. They obviously will not have the same level of teaching experience, but some will then face linguistic issues. And for example, in the Irish medium sector, there will be many children who are being taught in the Irish medium uh, background now, whose parents would not have had perhaps the same opportunities during their period, and their, um, their knowledge of Irish would not be as great as their children. So that's, a, a, I suppose, a level of barrier. But I think there are resources being put into that as well. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer on a, a sector of our children who need, perhaps need additional resources. The Minister, I'm sure, will agree with me that looked after children often require additional help, whether that's pre COVID or through COVID. What additional measures have been put in place for these young people to ensure that they are not further disadvantaged? Well, I think, look, it's, it's part of the wider picture in terms of vulnerable children. I think there's been interaction in terms of looked after children with the Department of Health to try and provide whatever level of, of support, try and work on an interagency basis. It is also the case, which I think is something which at least is quite welcoming. The, uh, obviously, any looked after children will also count as part of the wider pool of vulnerable children. We have seen a much greater degree of opportunity. One of the things that was made very clear um, during this lockdown was an encouragement of vulnerable children and looked after children to be directly in schools. The uptake in that has been much greater this time than has been previously the, the case. Uh, and I think one of the things that was very concerning in the first lockdown was the number of particularly vulnerable children who were not directly interacting with schools, were not in schools whenever they had the, the opportunity. Uh, and I have to say, from discussions that I would have had with uh, ministerial colleagues in different jurisdictions, that was, not, that was not a problem that was simply in Northern Ireland, but was found to be common in a number of jurisdictions. I think it's the considerable greater level of uptake and support that directly is happening by way of that. Um, supported learning that is happening and supervised learning that is happening within schools, particularly for looked after children. But it, it remains something that is ongoing work, uh, and particularly in terms of looking after children, um, not just from my own department, but working closely, particularly with the, the health department uh, and the good work of his own ministerial colleague on the, on the subject. We try to work closely on that too. Particularly, I think there is a need in these, it is very difficult for all young people, but particularly for our most vulnerable in society, need that level of support. Can I urge members when asking a supplementary question to connect to the earlier oral question, the listed question? 
And I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, I'll be question number three. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, with um, your permission, I will answer number three and number nine uh, together. I, I'm, committing to, I'm committed to ensuring the, uh, the executive children and young people strategy is taken forward as a matter of urgency, despite the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, if anything, it's even more vital in the current context that we work together in a coordinated way to improve the lives of children and young people and address the issues they face. In many cases, these issues and the problems that, that many children face have been exacerbated by the pandemic. The Children and Young People Strategy provides the vehicle for coordinated action. It has been developed with extensive input from a wide range of stakeholders, including crucially young people themselves. It reflects what is important to them. Its aims are ambitious and will only be achieved if we cooperate with renewed commitment to address the many challenges identified. My officials are currently developing, in partnership with other departments, a cross-departmental uh, delivery plan which will set out the actions to be taken over the next three years. These actions will, will focus on, which is part of the, uh, the plan, the 40 areas of greatest focus, and these have been identified by stakeholders and listed within the strategy. The delivery plan will identify where cooperation will be required to address specific issues and who will be involved. We are also compiling a suite of population indicators, which will be used to track progress in outcomes and uh, help us gauge what real difference is being made to the lives of children and young people. I intend to bring the delivery plan to the Executive for approval by May of this year, before it issues for public consultation. I call Harry Harvey for supplement. Deputy Speaker, thank you, Minister, for your answers thus far. Could the Minister indicate how the implementation will be monitored? Look, I think, it, it, as I said, the, um, the delivery plan itself will be something that will touch on all departments, probably some a bit more so than others. But I think all departments, in collaboration with their delivery partners, because there's also third sector bodies, there will be um, arm's length bodies, uh, those departments will be responsible for the implementations of the actions which they have identified in the plan. Some will be cross cutting, some will fall, particularly to an individual department. On behalf of the Executive, my department has lead responsibility for publishing, monitoring and reporting to the Assembly on the Children's uh, and Services Cooperation Act. And the monitoring of the delivery plan is a key element of this process. To support this, then, the Department will be putting in place monitoring and reporting structures which will oversee the delivery of the strategy, provide accountability and aid cooperation. It is intended also it's important that a wide range of stakeholders, not just in terms of where we have got to, but that a wide range of stakeholders will have a voice in the monitoring process. This will include, amongst others, the Northern Ireland uh, Commissioner for Children and Young People, the statutory children's authorities, children's service providers, academic and practice-based research, but also, most importantly, children, young people and parents themselves. I call Karen Killen. Uh, I thank the Minister for his responses thus far. And I, I welcome the fact that his report will be brought forward in May. But surely he would agree with me that some of our most vulnerable children and young people, particularly those going through special education, um, are, should be our priority, particularly now, given the situation we are in. I do understand his position regarding vaccination, particularly for those in special schools, the whole entire staff. But could I use this opportunity for him to talk to his colleague in health to ensure that all school, all the school community, teaching staff and every member of the school community is, for is, questions. is, is vaccinated. So would the member uh, bring that back to his executive colleague on Thursday, please? Well, I, I'd be happy to have constant, I, I will be having fairly constant discussions. The executive, I suppose, took a view that they wanted, first of all, to get a level of consensus. So obviously the health minister and particularly the health department will be critical to that. Uh, it is also the case, I think, that the executive specifically while I have highlighted the education sector, there will be other departments will take a view of specific groups within their remit that should also be prioritised in terms of vaccination. It is fairly clear that that will operate on the basis of the JCVI uh, position. But I, look, I would share with the, the, the member her view, and I have made it clear on a number of occasions, I want to see prioritisation for the wider education sector. I think there is highlighted a particular need and a strongest need within the special schools sector. Uh, and that is because of both the vulnerability of the children, but also the level of interaction that is there. And there has been some progress on that. But 
Uh, I want to see a situation in which there is early vaccination of all education staff, because I think as well that will be a benefit to our children, to our parents, but also to those staff and being able to provide a level of continuity. But obviously that will be part of wider uh, departmental, sorry, wider executive discussions. And I suspect given the desire to ensure that, that, uh, that in terms of at present the, the rollout is on the basis of a, an agreed prioritisation list, um, I think the role particularly of the executive will be to try to, to lobby and give a Northern Ireland voice to that uh, larger and wider discussion. Given, I think, where we are, are having the uh, overall level of success in terms of vaccination uh, process and the number of key groups that are being um, of clear clinical vulnerability that are being um, reached with that, I think there's a clear debate which is opening up more and more and will be uh, across all a range of jurisdictions on what are the next steps and I think prioritising key worker groups I think have got to form part of the, the overall thinking uh, within that. Uh, but I think to some extent that will go, it will include education staff, I think it will have to go slightly beyond that as well. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I, I agree with the member for North Belfast. The key aim of the children and young persons strategy is healthy children. So can I ask the Education Minister to be clearer? Which special school staff will be vaccinated and when in order to promote safe and healthy special schools during this pandemic? Well, I thank the member for um, his question. As I indicated, my position is I think there is still a good argument saying that all special schools should be. Uh, there has been ongoing work between involving uh, the department, the EA, strategic leadership group of the special schools, uh, the public health agency and the CMO. What Health have indicated in terms of where they would prioritise vaccination um, is around a range of uh, children with particular clinical vulnerabilities. Uh, there is a list, but it's not expect, ex exclusive to that, I think of 16 interventions around that where staff will interact with that. Uh, I think we're at the stages where I think that, that uh, it's effectively a two-stage process where there's identification of the children that would be the staff will be interacting with. And then I think in terms of delivery on, directly on the ground, uh, there's then a role directly for the schools themselves to identify those staff. Now, I appreciate that puts sometimes the schools in a difficult position, but if, if health are indicating that they can only justify from a clinical point of view intervention where it is directly those staff that, that are involved, uh, I understand that that work is, is nearing completion, that the, uh, that the list of children are more or less there. I think the next step, uh, and I think the um, the principals have indicated that uh, they didn't want to do it directly over the half-term period, but that there would be identification of those. That will lead to a reasonable cohort of those. It will not go as far as ideally I would want to do, but I think part of that is to try to reach a level of consensus uh, within the executive and executive as regards, particularly with health. Health, understandably, and they can speak for themselves, will want, above all else, to ensure that the integrity of the JCVI programme is not in any way breached. And that's an understandable position. But again, I think there is benefit in actually ensuring that everybody within special schools um, is vaccinated as soon as possible. I call Justin McNulty. The Minister will know I've been like a broken record around the need for a more comprehensive programme than that being delivered on the restart. A recharge programme that helps kids recover and catch up physically, academically, socially, emotionally and mentally. A major focus in the children and young people strategy is on mental health and wellbeing. Given that we are now facing a crisis in mental health amongst our young people, what immediate, what immediate commitments can the Minister give in terms of additional funding or resources to help tackle this? Through the emotional health and wellbeing strategy, we were able to, um, as part of that which allies with the, the children's and young people's strategy, we were able to mainstream in 2021 uh, an additional five million directly from education, then with an additional support of a million and a half from health. There's uh, six and a half million directly this year's budget that has been baseline. Despite the fact that we're moving to a scenario in which effectively there will be flatline cash in next year's, we're ensuring that that on an ongoing basis will be baseline. But there was also, as part of that, uh, a level of £5 million that was made directly available in terms of COVID recovery in 2021. I think one of the slight degrees of frustration that we have seen sometimes with COVID on some of the, the issues is that COVID itself has both created the need for particular interventions and sometimes created a level of barriers to those interventions going as far as they, 
they can do so. There's restriction on the ground. As indicated um, to the member, the previous occasion, whenever I brought a paper to the executive, um, which then sort of indicated that, on balance, that we needed to uh, extend remote learning uh, to the 5th of March, that one of the key aspects of that was the seeking the commitment of the executive in terms of a new engage programme. Uh, you know, the member may call that recharge. We'll call it engage. Whatever. I, I, you know, I think we'll not disagree with the level of language. Uh, I think that in looking towards the recovery position, and there will be a, a broader paper will be brought to the executive. There is an overall ask, which, first of all, I think will involve both the educational catch-up, but also the mental health and well-being side of it. And I think there's got to be probably. I think one of the lessons is to look to see whether there's a greater level of flexibility. What's it? Physical, physical as well. I know the um, the member opposite will be getting all, all the children will learn through their paces on, on that side of it as well. Uh, I, I would say, in relation to that, uh, while I think the lead on those responsibilities lies principally with the Department of Education, there is also an important role where I think, particularly, the departments of health communities and others can step up within that. And I think there is also good work to be done in terms of working with partnership with third party organisations, particularly on, on issues around mental and physical uh, well-being. The Minister's uh, as time well. is up. Okay. Moving on, I call Steve Aiken. Uh, question number four. Sorry. There. The post-primary transfers are organised and operated by private providers. I understand to date only the Association for Quality Education Limited AQE has indicated its intention to initiate preparations for proceeding with tests in the next academic year. I will, however, be engaging with AQE Limited on these. Sorry, I will be engaging with AQE Limited on these arrangements. However, it is vital that AQE Limited also engage with pupils, parents, and other stakeholders sooner rather than later on how the tests will be conducted, including their approach to the safety of children. While the post-primary transfer consortium um, outlines its proposals, or sorry, when it does, similar engagement will be taken forward at that point with PPTC for the GL tests as well. Nicole Steve Aiken. Thank the Minister for his uh, answer so far. And I need to declare an interest here, as I have one of my daughters who will be going through the transfer test procedure if it goes ahead later on this year. But the question is, is Minister, is that previously we have been pushing quite hard for transfer tests to be taking place within the primary school settings themselves. And indeed, could you say whether you are having any engagement directly to see if that process can indeed take place? Yeah, look, I think the, the aim would be to try to uh, proceed with, with engagement. Now, I think the problem, I suppose, tends to be twofold. One, obviously, as, as they are privately set um, tests, then ultimately I think that AQE and PPTC would need to be bought into that. Having said that, I suspect that is not the barrier. Uh, the problem, I suppose, is that, that um, back in 2016 there, there had been a long-standing. Um, I don't know how much it was entirely a bar, or at least a memo was sent out uh, saying primary schools are not to be used for, as a host for that. That was lifted in 2016 by myself in that regard. So there is no barrier to um, it being held in a, in a primary school. What we would need, because the the opportunity for it to be held in primary schools will require the buy-in of primary schools themselves. It will require, largely speaking, the boards of governors. And I suppose uh, I'll be happy to convene people to sit around the table to um, discuss that. I think one of the problems is that if we were to get buy-in, we need effectively buy-in across the board. Because if we ended up with a scenario where some pupils even were able to sit within their own primary schools and many others were not, you'd create a sort of a home and away advantage. Uh, but look, I think I think the best. I would agree with the member. I think that the best possible place uh, for pupils to actually sit transfer tests would be in the, the environments of their own primary school. And that is the end of our period of time for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Declan McAleer. Uh, I'd um, like to ask the member, the, the minister, uh, has he any ass assessment? of the level of um, engagement with remote learning amongst pupils in this lockdown compared to the lockdown last year. And I will uh, also declare an interest as a parent of, uh, of two teenagers at home who are, who are grappling with this new uh, uh, means of uh, education. Thank you. And I'm sure, I'm sure the member opposite will be a very good example to be able to promote sort of remote learning with them. Look, I think we, we are monitoring the, the situation as regards remote learning, um, directly speaking within, within schools, both ETI uh, are looking at the broader element of, of remote learning. Each school has a, a link officer. Um, and indeed, as part of that, all schools were told at the beginning of this year, because while I think none of us in September would necessarily have anticipated where we would be in 
February of the following year, uh, the situation was there was obviously an acceptance there was likely to be levels of disruption. So all schools were told to have a remote learning plan in place. Certainly the, the sense of things I would get is that the levels of remote learning, because I think, to be fair, there was an element where, where schools were somewhat taken by surprise uh, last spring. I think the, the levels of remote learning have been considerably improved, uh, and indeed the, the standard of that. But obviously the, the problems with remote learning are not simply what is happening for the individual with the either devices or indeed the lesson plans, but the fact that I think one of the disadvantages of remote learning compared to face-to-face -face teaching uh, is that it, it's taking that, that pupil out of the environment where it can be a strong learning uh, environment, where they are with their fellow pupils in front of a teacher. And while it, there's a tremendous work that's been done, particularly by parents during the, the, the lockdown, um, it, can only be, it can never be quite as good as the direct uh, intervention within the schools itself. for supplementary. Um, I thank the, the Minister for his uh, comprehensive uh, answer. Obviously, the, um, the disruption uh, of face-to-face -face learning, which is compounded by many other factors, um, including broadband, an issue which I raised previously with his colleague, the Economy Minister, indeed, but me, um, also with my colleague Nicola Brogan has been as well. You know, uh, this dis disruption will obviously have an invariable impact in the. Uh, the curriculum and indeed their qualifications. What preparations has the department got in place to try and ameliorate uh, these challenges that, of disruption to the curriculum and the qualifications? I mean, the members right. The, the, I think there's a level of disruption to the curriculum. I think uh, by accepting that, that, that remote learning is not cannot be of the same amount of quality as face-to-face -face teaching, we shouldn't also though fall into the trap of believing that necessarily that means that there is a. Uh, across the board, a, a loss of learning. But what I think that uh, does need to happen, that's what I'll be putting for the detailed proposals to the executive, is a sort of a catch up programme. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if Mr. McNulty is very nice, he might even call it a recharge programme, uh, which, which impacts uh, not just on mental health and, and physical well being, but also particularly at the academic catch up. Those will have different strands to it. So it is about what is done during the remainder of this academic year. Uh, and also then what happens, what additional interventions, there were some last year in terms of during the summer can be done during that, particularly on a voluntary basis, and then what additional support can be provided during 2021-22. Uh, I think it's also the case that, that particularly as regards to qualification years, the member uh, will be aware that certainly for 2021 there's a different model of assessment has been put in place uh, which moves away for this year away from examinations for 2021 because I think it would be unfair to try to subject uh, pupils to that. And clearly there will be a knock-on effect into 2022 in terms of how we look at qualifications. And indeed, I think there will be, unfortunately, with a lot of things in society, there will be echoes of the problem that we're having with COVID that will resonate probably for years to come. And it's about trying to ameliorate those as much as possible, rather than be in a position necessary to get absolutely everything, um, everything removed as a problem. And I call Paul Gibbon. Speaker, Minister, could you outline any plans to bring forward legislation to this House? I thank the member for his question. My priority with the time remaining in this mandate is to bring forward legislation which addresses issues relating to the flexibility of school starting age. I have instructed officials to begin scoping out the work for a potential bill within this mandate. I fully support the, uh, the concept that parents, especially those with premature children, who are born late in the academic year should have some level of flexibility around this issue. That is why I have instructed officials to prioritise this bill as my department's key legislative priority. Given the close proximity to the end of the current mandate, there will be significant pressure on the executive's legislative programme. Any legislation I will bring forward will therefore depend upon the executive agreeing to proposals from all ministers as well as members. On a personal note, I have made aware cases of people like Freddie and Isaac. There were two premature boys whose parents would love some flexibility around school starting age. Let me assure the House that I will do all within I can to address those concerns on behalf of boys such as Freddie and Isaac, and many more like them whose parents have campaigned on this issue. Paul, Paul, given. 
Well, Minister, can I welcome that announcement um, that there will be that flexibility given for June birthdays uh, and indeed uh, where you have premature children? Uh, I know that is something that uh, many families will welcome and indeed charities that have campaigned on this issue will welcome this announcement today by you, Minister. Can you assure the House that given the time frame that is left for this mandate that the various different stages will be completed uh, and royal assent given to this bill uh, before the next election? Well, as I've said, we're just over a year away from the end of the current mandate, and the legislative programme will be busy. So I've asked my officials to prioritise the policy development work and the consultation that will be needed before its introduction to the House. I mean, there is across the board, I think our, our school system largely works well, but it doesn't work for everybody in terms of that, that flexibility. So in taking this forward, um, officials will need to assess the implications across a broad range of policy areas, including what happens to preschool provision, special education the age at which a person commences post-primary education and school leaving age, uh, the curriculum at key stages in area planning. So many of, because I think many of these policy areas are also set out in primary legislation. I will also need to assess the impact on our educational partners, the Education Authority, for instance, CCMS and CCEA, uh, the Controlled Schools Council, and rightly uh, conduct extensive public consultation. This will take a number of months, but it should provide, I think we want to have a sound policy basis for taking forward. Uh, future legislation that meets the needs uh, of the young people that most benefit from it. And, and I'm sure I know the Education Committee, I think, uh, while there will be the odd issue that on other points we may have a little bit of clashes, but I believe that the Education Committee, I think, will be very constructive and positive when this eventually comes before them. And in the meantime, I think it's important that parents make informed choices about what they want to do, including mm. speaking to the school that they uh, may apply to discuss how their child will uh, transition into year one. I call Trevor Long. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, just to go back to Dr. Aiken's question a few moments ago. Um, in, re in recent years, even pre COVID, several grammar schools decided that they would move away from academic selection. So, can I ask the Minister, is he content with that trend, or would he intend to put any pressure on those schools to revert to his, his preferred system? Or will he content, let, let matters take their course? Look, I think legally, first of all, there is both a right of academic selection in law. Uh, it is also the case that um, the, the position is that legally it is actually the responsibility of the boards of, of governors. Look, I believe in the right of, of schools to use academic selection, so I will not be pressurising them into a position to abandon it. And we are seeing, and again, um, I think through no fault of anybody within the system, because I think it's been overtaken by COVID, we are seeing a range of difficulties that will translate and probably be. Uh, magnified when it comes to the point in June when um, individual pupils and families will find out the destination of their, uh, of their location for post-primary school, that in a system, certainly without any level of alternative, that without a transfer test, there are a lot of problems that that creates in and of it, itself on that basis. And I think the issue is that, that while, for instance, we will recommend a range from the point of view of guidance of here are criteria which we believe to be better than others, almost inevitably with any form of criteria, will advantage somebody as opposed to somebody else on that basis. So, look, I will be working with the sector. I don't believe that, in general, there's a particularly, certainly from those schools, um, and I can't certainly speak for all of them, but those schools that felt this year they were unable to use academic selection because of the lack of a transfer test, I think are largely very heavily and strongly committed to using academic uh, selection. But uh, the choice remains, because it is an issue for Board of Governors, that they do have the choice whether to use that or not. And I know also that in the past some schools have used it for particular streams of, and done a sort of a bilateral approach as well. And that is also something that is legally permissible. I call Trevor Lund for supplement. Yes, I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, and I do appreciate these are difficult times and perhaps not the best time to have this discussion. But there, there, would the Minister consider, given that a number of schools now have, for this year, in fact, all the grammar schools, will have chosen their input without uh, the benefit of academic testing, that it might be an opportunity to study those schools, particularly the ones who had already made the decision not to go with selection tests, and to see what effect, if any, it's had on their performance? Well, I, think, I think the issue, if we're talking about performance to some extent, because if you're looking at what the intake is within a particular year, you know, that certainly in terms of for example, where does that appear in terms of academic records on that basis? I think it would be something that would take a number of years to be able to determine, because anybody, for instance, entering simply in year eight in September 
in terms of particularly where they would show up on, for instance, GCSE statistics, um, you know, I, I think it will simply shift about the balance uh, a little bit. But we do, I believe, have a system which across the board does have high levels of success. We've seen both at primary level and post-primary level that when we've had comparators, in many cases to um, other jurisdictions across the world, that we have had a, a, a considerable level of success, uh, and also in terms of reducing underachievement uh, as well. I call Gemma Dolan. The Minister will be aware of commentary in recent weeks about how best to recover lost learning time, and as part of that conversation, the idea of whether to pause and repeat this academic year has been suggested. While this may be of benefit to some children and young people, I don't think such a blanket proposal is the solution. Can the Minister advise what contingencies are in place if a parent feels that it is in their child's best interest to repeat this year? Uh, well, I would be uh, at one with the, the member in terms of the overall assessment of that. I think the the idea, and I appreciate you know, people will be looking at blue skies thinking it's, it's perfectly natural in relation to that. In terms of the repetition of a year across the board uh, would create enormous, leaving anything else, would create enormous practical difficulties in terms of, if we're looking at the issue that was mentioned earlier about accommodation within schools, about you know, do we have a situation where children then operate on the basis of a 15-year, do they skip a year at a later stage, etc. Uh, and also actually the, evide- uh, the educational information would suggest that, generally speaking, where there is repetition of a year, in general, on average, it, uh, for a lot of pupils, it certainly is not a, an advantage. In some cases, it can be a level of disadvantage. For specific individuals, there is provision, I think, that the uh, Board of Governors can accept a child um, effectively repeating a year or being a year late. Now, within the, the current system, that is done in a relatively small number of cases. Across the board, I think there, out of the 330,000 children that are within the school system, there's a, a little bit over 5,000 of those are over age for their year. Most of those, however, will be through particular circumstances of either special educational needs or quite often, very understandably, for some newcomer children, particularly who have language difficulties. Around about 2,000 within the system are, are over age. So it will be for boards of governors to consider that and, I suppose, for parents to make a representation on an individual case to that. But I think parents do need to be careful just in terms of the implications of what they do for their child as well. They will be in the best position to judge the individual interests, but it's not an easy solution for people, and I don't think people should go into it blindly either. I call Gemma Dolan for supplement. Thank you, and I thank you, Minister, for your answer. Um, as part of this conversation around pausing and repeating the academic school year, the issue of applying flexibility to school starting age has been highlighted again, and I welcome that you intend to bring legislation forward to provide the level of flexibility that many parents and children need. But what can those parents who want flexible, flexible school starting age now, particularly in light of COVID, do? Well, directly speaking, I think it is about engaging with, with their schools. I think uh, with the best will in the world, um, the aim will be to bring legislation forward this autumn. That will not directly impact on the 2021 cohort, and there's nothing we can do retrospectively. Part of the problem, uh, as indicated in terms of the rigidity there, is on the basis that, that what we have is in terms of school starting ages in primary legislation. So it, it can't just be, if you like, some clever manoeuvre from any of us to be able to, to get round that. I think what I would encourage parents is to engage directly with, with their schools. You know, it should also be the case, I think, I want to be clear on this, that I think there is a lot of work to be done on the flexibility. This is not something where people simply have a broad ideological or a belief that it's just too early to be starting at that age. It's got to be under very specific circumstances because we need something which can work for the, the system. And broadly speaking, the system does work well in terms of, um, in terms of school participation, in terms of, uh, of academic progress for children. But the lack of any level of flexibility means that for some families, they are left in a, an impossible position. And it is about trying to deal with those exceptions rather than the, the rule, which I think will be critical as we move ahead in terms of school age flexibility. Our time is running out. I call Pat Cackney for a quick ch- question. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Minister, uh, you will be aware of the huge increase in the number of children and young people uh, who have had to be placed in care. Um, from the Education Committee, my colleague here, Justin McDulty, found that there was 178. Minister, what plans are you putting in place to support young people and their families, both now and in your COVID recovery plan? Thank you, Minister. Well, the recovery plan has got to be comprehensive across a range of issues and probably look, as I said, not simply at the academic, but mental health, physical well-being. Uh, but also the interaction of specifically groups will require um, 
you know, cross-departmental work, working with health and that sort of things, because solving some of the issues for individuals will be on a very individual tailored basis. And that's why I think that's where the focus needs to be for those particular children. That is the end of our period of questions. The Minister of Education. We now turn to item five in the order of paper the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned.